Good morning. Good morning. It's one of the rare Sundays where it seems like most people are already seated, but I need the rest of you to gather. It's been a beautiful weekend. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have. I've uh, made the joke a couple times because uh, people are asking, how, how come Jeff is here if I'm on the microphone? And I said, he's on administrative leave. He's not on min administrative leave. It's just a joke. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I have to be careful about that because I, I know that my sense of humor is sort of deadpan, a little twisted, yeah. And people sometimes don't catch my sarcasm. So, I just better be clear. <laughs> Everything's good. Um, good morning. Welcome. Um, I was just talking to somebody outside uh, about how announcements always throw me through a loop because I spend the whole week thinking about Bible study and then I spend like two minutes thinking about announcements right before we start, and my wife was actually telling me about it on the way. You sound like you have no idea what you're doing every time you do announcements. <laughs> it's because I don't have any idea what I'm doing and every time I get up to do announcements. And that's something I know I've talked about for years, and I just need to get it better, better at it. So here's me trying to work it out live. Do we have um, Easter slides? It says something here, and there's like some stuff is crossed out. I don't see any. There is? There they go. Easter's coming up, guys. So Good Friday service is going to be 12 to 1 on Good Friday. And then it's, that says this is April 7th, and I'm really bad with calendar dates. So that's probably right, but it's handwritten on here. And then Easter is the 9th, which is going to be our normal time. We're not going to have any special service times. We're not going to do two services, regular, same bat time, same bat channel. I'm glad you crowd can appreciate that. When I make that joke with the, the, the junior high and the high school group, they, have, yeah, they don't know who Adam West is. So, you're going to, Jan Hagel's going to come up here in a minute. Um, is this microphone good? All right. But before that, let's see, we have the Tuesday morning women's prayer at Karen Kinney's house. You can contact her or Jan for directions, and also the same uh, with the emergency prayer chain. And if you want to be added to the prayer chain, I'm sure that, you know, it'd be really good to add links to the chain, more people that we can get praying for people, but also if you have uh, a need, uh, please contact Karen Kinney. And, all right, Janet, you're up. I'm going to walk away so I don't... Okay. Good morning. <laughs> so, we have a new... We finished the Revelation study. With, um, with all the ladies, and it was awesome. So we're going to start a new study, and it's going to start April 13th. It is a Thursday, and it's called Courage, and it's by Jennifer... Thank you. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and um, it's only a seven-week study. It's just to get us through to summer, and then we'll take a little break for summer, and then we'll do something again in, in the fall. So um, so it's on Thursday at 9.30, Karen Kinney's house, and so we'd love to have whoever can be there. Yes? Question? Is it always going to be on Thursdays from now on? Well, and for seven weeks, it's going to be on Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> So I, after that, I'm, I'm really not sure. So um, any more questions? Okay. <laughs> okay, that, I think that's it. Uh, projectionist, thank you. 
Um, I'm not used to doing announcements either. <laughs> um, so uh, just one more projectionist is what we're looking for. It's not an emergency. Um, Lily, yeah, yet. Um, Lily and I are doing projections and Amanda when she can be here. And so, but if there's one more person that has a heart, has an understanding of computer, um, it's easy. It's, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So, um, just one more projectionist. So think about that, pray about it, and that's, that's it for now. Okay. I'll take that, okay. just in case. I don't know why it would be just in case. Um, so that's women's study, and it's funny that you asked about the uh, if it's always going to be Thursday, because that's one of those, it's hard to find the day that works for everybody, and it, we're working through that with the, the men's group also. Right now, we are meeting Friday mornings, which can be pretty difficult if you have a job Friday mornings, which... If you have a job, it's probably going to be Friday morning. So um, Will's working on getting together a different, you know, after hours kind of thing, or perhaps um, at least once a month where we can get together if you're not available for like a weekly thing. So we're working on that. And if you are at all interested or if you've got... Um, you know, a time. It would only work for me if you did it at three in the afternoon on Tuesday. Go ahead and talk to Will too. Don't talk to me about it because I'll forget. And he's in charge. When I show up on Fridays, I'm not Pastor Tommy. I'm just Tommy. And that's been really good for me too, by the way. I'm really enjoying the book that we're going through. So now we're on to prayer. And um, I don't see anybody new on this sheet, but we definitely want to keep our regulars in prayer, uh, David Klein and um, David Just, and uh, Bill and Tammy. Uh, Bill was here last week, and uh, he looked great, and in fact, every I, I was standing and talked to him. I came over to tell him, hey man, you look great, because I expected him to look sick, and while I was standing there talking to him, two or three other people came up to said the same thing, hey Bill, you look great. And Tammy kept saying, stop telling him that because he's going to get his head big. Just leave him alone. But he did. He was the most popular guy at church last week. It was really good to see him. So he's still in the fight. And um, I saw a Facebook post, and I don't see anything here about it, of uh, Chase Milligan's mom. Remember, he was the guy that got in that real bad car accident. And he just got a summer internship with the Roseville Fire Department. So that's how good he's doing. He's doing really, really good. He's, right now, he is doing administrative stuff, and they are you know, having him run supplies out and stuff like that, but he's hoping to be able to jump on the truck and go out to calls and stuff as that um, becomes available to him. So that's awesome news. And, of course, we have our, our military men and women that we want to pray for, and there's one up there that's a new slide. That's Brandon Bardot. I don't know if you guys remember Brandon. Um, I'm sure that you probably do. You'd know, you'd know his face, but uh, Chuck and Vanessa are his parents, and you'd know them too. So he's in boot camp right now. He joined the Army National Guard, and I guess boot camp is, you know, kind of easy for them because he sent out a picture to his mom not too long ago. That he has his phone, so he's doing all right, but... Uh, just want to keep him in prayer. And, of course, all of our other folks that we have. I think Caleb Johnson just got finished moving. He got reassigned. I think we talked about that a while ago, and he just moved. I can't remember what, but he's doing um, pilot training. So he's going to learn how to fly something, and probably a helicopter. Now they, they have him like four different choices. If like, and you get to make your choice based on where you graduate in their, their program. So he doesn't know exactly what he's going to fly. So with that, 
our local law enforcement and first responders also. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that we can gather here. We can uh, fellowship together. We can worship you in your name, Lord, and uh, we're just grateful for this place and this time and this family of people that we get to, to be together. And Lord, we want to lift up those who couldn't be here for whatever reason. Um, Lord, I'm thinking of, of David Just and uh, David Klein and uh, Bill and Tammy and all those folks that we pray for so often, Lord, to ask that you would be their comforter, be their healer. Lord, we know that you are strong to heal, that we know that you have the power to do that, and we know that that you love those people just as much as we do, more than we do. And so, Lord, if it's by your will, we pray that you would uh, put them back together, put their bodies right, and uh, keep them here with us longer. And, uh, Lord, we also want to lift up the uh, our, our service men and women who we pray for all the time, Lord, um, especially Brandon out there in boot camp right now. Lord, I pray that you would uh, keep him uh, safe, keep him from getting injured or sick or anything else, and uh, help him to, to see this through and Lord uh, just be with all of those those guys and those girls who are out there keeping us safe and Lord now as we come before your throne and worship you Lord we pray that we would have hearts and hands that are clean to worship you and that you'd be glorified by us in Jesus name we pray amen amen stand worship our
thank you so much for who you are, what you've done for us, and uh, we do pray that we can we can love you back with our lives and from the the inside out, Father, continue to change us and mold us into who you want us to be. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated if you wish.
Jesus, we are in awe of you. We are so grateful for all that you've done for us. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you. And Lord, now as we continue to worship you with hearts full of gratitude and praise, Lord, we ask that you would teach us from your word. Pray that you would speak through me, that uh, I would be a see-through servant as Jeff always prays. Lord, that that be true of me also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody. We are going to be in the book of Luke today, and we're going to be finishing off chapter 19 and then heading into chapter 20. Luke is my uh, midweek Thursday night study that we've been, that's my text. Oh yeah, children's ministry, which is just my kids. You guys, you guys can go. Good luck to you, Kent. <laughs> but, uh, wait a minute, my throat's dry from singing. Luke. I just so happened, as Easter season is approaching, I just... We got to the uh, triumphal entry last week, just a few weeks ahead of time. So uh, rather than go off somewhere else or try to delay that, I just went on through. So last Thursday, we did the uh, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, which I kind of sort of saw in a different way studying this time. I, I haven't really seen it before that way, and I don't know if I conveyed it very well when I came inside after that. I, there's a goat at the end of the, the Bible study, by the way. If you want to watch and see a goat, it's at, very, at the very end. And, and I kind of recommend you just skip to that point because I told my wife, man, that was the worst Bible study I ever gave. It was, I feel like I set the record a lot of times. Like, yep, that's the new low. But uh, I, the thing that I had noticed before was I don't know that Jesus necessarily considered his entry into, G, into Jerusalem to be all that triumphant. He went and sent his disciples ahead to go and get the donkey for him to ride upon. And he did that to show everybody, hey, I'm not coming in Jerusalem as the conquering king. I'm coming as the humble savior, the, the servant. And Everybody saw him on his way into Jerusalem, and they're putting their coats down on the road, and they're waving the palm branches, and they're singing, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But in their hearts, they were praising the conquering king. They weren't welcoming their humble savior. And so as Jesus drew near to Jerusalem, he wept 
And I think he wept because he had come to his beloved people and they missed what he had come for. And so he says to them, and this is Luke 19.42, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So they missed it. But now he's in Jerusalem, and now he knows it's the last week of his life. He's got a lot of stuff that he wants to do in Jerusalem before the crucifixion, and he starts by cleaning house, very literally. So here we are in Luke 19. I'm in the wrong spot. Verse 45. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. So I'm sure most of you, all of you, I'm sure you know that, that when you read through the Gospels, some of the events don't always line up chronologically the way they do with the other Gospels. And, and that's because the different writers decided, hey, this fits better for the thing that I'm trying to convey in my writing of the Gospels. And so they just moved some of the events around sometimes. And so in the, the Gospel of John, Jesus cleans the temple at the beginning of his ministry. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they put it at the end here and um, right after he enters Jerusalem. And it, you know, it doesn't really matter, honestly, when that occurred, because when you read those different Gospels, it really fits with what they're trying to convey. You know, it's great at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he does that. He cleans, cleans the temple in the book of John. And it really fits what, with what we're going to talk about this morning um, in Jerusalem as Jesus is confronting some of the leaders in Israel. And basically, just to give you a, a sneak peek at the rest of the Bible study, uh, the rest of the text that we're going to be talking about, Jesus is basically informing all of the religious leaders of that day that their stewardship of Israel is about to be over. And so... Before he does that, he basically gives them a quick rundown. Here's the summary of what's going to happen, and he cleans the temple. And that serves as also sort of a physical illustration of what he has come to Jerusalem to do. So this conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, we've watched the tension sort of build through the book of Luke. And it's about to come to its ultimate conclusion. And I know a lot of people think of that as, yeah, of course, it's going to come to its conclusion because the Pharisees are going to have Jesus crucified. But that's not really the actual end of the, the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees because that would mean that the Pharisees won, and they didn't. The end of the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees is when Jesus just completely dismantles and eliminates the whole need for any sort of uh, scribe or Pharisee or priest or anybody else. He, the stewardship is, is over. And I know for me when I read the Gospels and I see especially the Holy Week when Jesus is spending so much time arguing with people and they confront him and they attack him and they come after him and Jesus just does this debate kung fu on all of the people that come up against him. I love it. And I just, in my heart, I'm rooting for Jesus and I'm like, yeah, get him, get him. Because it's been so long that they disrespect Jesus. It's been so long that they, you know, mock him. And I'm, it just feels so good to watch Jesus tear them apart. But I, I was thinking about it this week. Jesus didn't have that included in his life story in the Gospels over and over and over again so that we could have some sort of like fan service at the end of the Gospels. He included all of that stuff because he wanted us to learn from that. And so when Jesus is talking about the stewardship of the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests, he's talking to us too. It's not just those guys. You need to tell those guys what bad people they are. He's talking to us too. So as we talk about the stewardship of the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, I want you to think about the stewardship that you have also and how Jesus is talking to you and me about that stewardship. So 
Jesus cleansed the temple, and he also tells us why. He says the, the people who had, been, who had been given the responsibility of the, the care and the function of the religious you know, temple and, and all the services and all of that stuff that they did there, they had failed. They had, they had failed not only God, but they had failed Israel. God had intended his house to be a house of prayer, as he says there. But the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests had turned all of it just into another way to enrich themselves, to sort of consolidate their power. And if you don't know what Jesus was cleansing there, they had basically set up a courtyard in the temple where they would sell you a, a lamb or a goat or whatever it was that you had to, to sacrifice. And they would also inspect any livestock that you were bringing to sacrifice for Passover. It was a, you know, required. Everybody would come to this religious feast, and a lot of people would bring their own animal to sacrifice. And they, you know, would inspect your animal and say, oh, nope, it's blemished. You can't sacrifice that here. It's not good enough to give to God, but we can sell you this one at five times the price. And so they had set up this, I mean, it's a great way for them to, and they probably, you know, they probably bought the blemish one off of them and they'd turn it around and sell it to the next guy. So it was a, a really clever scheme for them to enrich themselves and make a whole bunch of money. So that's what Jesus was uh, cleansing the temple of. And so the religious leaders, the people who had been profiting by exploiting God's house and God's people, they didn't like what Jesus did. So they were looking for a way to respond. It says that they were trying to destroy Jesus, but of course all the people were just hanging on Jesus' every word, as it says, and so they didn't know how to attack him. So they took his, their first shot by trying to undermine, and undermine Jesus' authority. So now we're in, in Luke chapter 20, verse 1. One day, as Jesus sought as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, tell us by what authority you do these things or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. You, now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So the religious leaders come to Jesus and they demand to know, by whose authority are you doing these things? You know, Jesus had just come in the day before and wiped out their profit-making market in the temple courtyard. And now he has occupied that same space and he is teaching the people. And so they come up to him, hey, do you have the right permits? Who said that you could do this? Because we, none of us said that it was okay. Jesus, who said this was okay for you to be here and doing these things? By whose authority? The topic of authority is one of those things that gets to be a philosophical debate really quickly, really easily. And if you don't believe me, you've never had a conversation with someone who always votes libertarian. That comes, I mean, if you want to, to get somebody spun up, ask them by what authority the police can write you a parking ticket. Or maybe should you have a fishing permit to fish fish out of your own pond? That You ask a libertarian about that and they're gonna start giving you all kinds of philosophical questions and answers about authority by, you know, where does authority come from? All the rest. Now, Jesus could have very easily tied these guys up in knots with those questions, made them confused and sent them away, not understanding anything. But instead, he jumps over that whole tangled mess of philosophical questions and jumps right to what actually matters. The only question about authority that really matters, who is in charge? Who has authority? Is it God or is it man? And he doesn't ask that as a sort of ivy tower scholarly question. He doesn't ask the question in a vacuum. He gives them a very practical example of the authority of man coming in conflict with the authority of God, John the Baptist. 
John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. You know, turn away from the bad things you're doing, live a life that proves that you have turned away, that you have really repented, and get baptized. And Jesus' question to the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, where did that come from? Did God send John with this message, or did John make it up himself? John the Baptist was a pretty touchy subject for the Pharisees because they didn't exactly have a good relationship with him. The, uh, the book of Matthew records this interaction with John and the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 5, it says, Then Jerusalem and Judea and all the re- region ar- around, about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river, Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John sees these guys coming out, and he says, I wish that you didn't even know that I was out here so that God's wrath would fall upon you and you didn't have a chance to repent. So they weren't exactly friendly with John the Baptist. But Jesus' question about John puts these guys in a bind because they know that they didn't do the things that John told them to do. They did not repent. They did not bear fruits worthy of repentance. And so they can't tell Jesus that obviously John came from, from heaven. That's where he got his authority. But they also can't say that they think John made it up on his own, that his authority was just man-based because all of the crowds felt that John was sent by God. He was a prophet, and they're afraid for their lives. That's how strongly they believe that. They, these people are going to pick up rocks and throw them at me until I die if I say that John the Baptist wasn't a prophet. And so they refuse. They say, hey, we can't. We don't know, which seems like something that a religious leader of the day, you really should have a good answer for that. But they say, we don't know. And so their refusal to answer this question about John, they, they're refusing to be honest, basically. And that demonstrates what they really felt. That, that shows all that we really need to know about the religious leaders of that day. They couldn't care less about what was right or wrong. They couldn't care less of, you know, maybe God sent a man to us with a specific message. They didn't care. All they cared about was what the crowd felt about them. Their authority was derived from man. That's what, that's what mattered to them. And so it's a neat little catch-22 that Jesus puts them in. By, by not answering, they revealed what was really true about them. And it also gives Jesus a really good reason not to answer them back. The fact that their authority is completely man-based is exactly why Jesus isn't going to answer them. In just a, about a week, the scribes and the Pharisees are going to arrest Jesus. They're going to put him on trial for the crime of claiming that he has authority from God, that he came from God. And they're going to execute him for that. They're going to condemn him to death. And so, of course, that's why Jesus came, right? But it's not yet. He's not ready for that yet. And so he, he also refuses to answer. He's not going to give them a direct answer of who told him he could show up and clean the temple, who told him that he could teach the people. Uh, he's not going to give them a direct answer to that. But he's going to tell them a story and indirectly answer their, their question. So here's... Uh, when Jesus begins to tell them about his authority. Verse 9. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a a vineyard, 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 and led it out to tenants and went into another country for for a long while. Not a little while, a long while. So this is a parable about a guy who had a vineyard and he rented it out to people and then went away. And it's one of those parables, you know, when you look at the parables, there's a lot of things that have metaphors in them, and you have to wonder, like, what does this mean? What does this symbolize? Things like that. This is one of those parables where all of the imagery is actually really obvious. It's, it's blatant. Jesus wasn't trying to, to hide anything with this parable. Uh, over and over again throughout the, the Bible, God refers to Israel as his vineyard. This is Psalms. Psalm 80, verse 8 and 9. It says, You brought a vine out of Egypt and drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took deep root and filled the land. And if you're at all familiar with the history of the Old Testament, that's pretty blatant who the psalmist was talking about. But Isaiah the prophet 
is even more clear. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7, it says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. So Israel is the vineyard. And so if Israel is the vineyard, it's pretty obvious also who are the tenants, who has been given stewardship over Israel. And I, I think the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, they probably like that description of themselves. Yeah, we're the tenants. We're in charge around here. God put us in charge of taking care of his vineyard. So you better respect our authority. So they like that. And I think it's very rapid. Jesus uh, establishes all of that. Just in one verse, here's some of the major players. But uh, the Pharisees didn't like what comes next. Verse 10. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the, vine of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he, he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, and this one they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir, let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? So the Pharisees don't like the parable anymore. They like to be in the tenants, but now Jesus reveals what kind of tenants they are. Uh, they're not leaders who obey God. They're not leaders who are taking good care of the, the stewardship that they've been given. They continually beat God's servants. They continually treat the people that God sends to them shamefully and send them away empty-handed. They did everything that they could to cling to the little bit of authority that God had given them without actually completing the task that God had given them the authority to perform. God had entrusted Israel to these men because he wanted them to make Israel fruitful. That was the whole point of their leadership position. They were responsible for the spiritual health of the nation. But when God sent his servants to receive some of that fruit, men like Isaiah or the rest of the prophets of the Old Testament, or men like John the Baptist, they had sent them all of those men away empty-handed. They didn't receive any fruit. So Jesus has laid out all of the things that have taken place up to this point, right? That's the history of Israel in a very quick nutshell. He's made it clear to them how they have been performing as stewards. Uh, he has made it clear who John the Baptist was and where his authority came from, right? They didn't answer. They would refuse to answer, but Jesus told them, John the Baptist came from God. He was a servant. God sent him here to receive fruit. He even said, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and they sent him away empty-handed. And so all of that is clear, and now it's clear also who Jesus is. Jesus is the son that the owner at the, of the vineyard finally sends at the end. At, at least they should respect my son. But the son is shortly to be killed and thrown out of the vineyard by the tenants. And so he asks them, how will the owner of the vineyard respond to this? What is the proper response? What would you do if, if this was you? If you had a vineyard and this was how your tenants treated you as the owner. More importantly, how is God going to respond to centuries of abuse and uh, exploiting his people, beating the sheep instead of taking care of the sheep? How is God going to respond to that? Verse 16, he will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. I love how direct and abrupt Jesus suddenly gets with these guys. He looks directly at them and tells them, hey, the stone's coming, it's going to crush you. He has been so patient. And, you know, this is the time where my heart goes, yeah, get him, Jesus. Tell him. 
He's been so patient with them so long. Imagine the restraint it would take. For years, Jesus has been walking around just trying to help people, healing the sick, putting people back together that are, are lame and broken, raising people from the dead, preaching God's word, and these people come out and mock him and challenge him and try to tear him down, and he has just shown nothing but patience and restraint, and they took it as weakness. They thought, yeah, we can boss this guy around, we can threaten him, and he's not gonna do anything about it. But not anymore, they're not secure. And, and Jesus tells him, look, the stone is coming, and it's gonna come and crush you. And it's funny to me that John the Baptist comes back into this because it was John the Baptist who gave them the first warning that their stewardship was coming to an end. This is the book of Luke chapter three, starting in verse eight and nine. It's, uh, this is John the Baptist talking. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then a little bit later down in verse 16 and 17, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork in his hand, is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's pretty strong language. The ax is here, it's gonna cut down the trees and throw them into the fire if they don't bear fruit. He's not messing around. And now Jesus is here. The day is coming quickly when they're gonna be destroyed and the vineyard is going to be entrusted to others. And the Pharisees hear this and they're shocked. Surely not, they say. They know that's them. They know that Jesus is talking about them. They know that they have let God down, that they have been disobedient, that they have fleeced the sheep, all the rest. They know this. And so even though Jesus describes a, per a perfectly reasonable response of the vineyard owner, like what else would he do? He's going to come and kill those guys. They're, no, how could he do that? They're shocked. But Jesus isn't going to let them ignore this warning. They're not, he's not going to let them weasel away. And so he, he presses the point even further with this quote from the Psalms where it says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's from Psalm 118, verse 22. And all of Psalm 118 is about how uh, God is going to bring his people victory over their enemies. No matter what enemies throw at them, no matter what comes against God's people, they are going to persevere. Even the builders who reject the stone, it becomes the chief cornerstone. But after all of that, I mean, those are some very, you know, the knives are out now. He's threatening them. But still, he presents them with a choice and opportunity. You can fall on the stone or the stone can fall on me. And, and it's, I've said this before in the book of Luke, it's kind of surprising to me. It's really surprising to me how persistent Jesus is in reaching out to these men who were his enemies. Over and over again, he is trying to get them to repent. He is trying to get them to turn away from their sins and make better choices with their lives, right? He's reaching out to his enemies. Even now, even at the end, he knows they're about to crucify him, but he's still giving them an opportunity to repent and be saved. That's what it looks like to me, right? I mean, I know that the idea of falling on the stone or the stone falling on you, that's open to some interpretation. But it reminds me of the whole concept of, in English we have this idiom of throwing yourself at the mercy of the court. That's when you get arrested, you go to court, and you recognize, yeah, you know what, you got me. I, I don't have any way to protest my innocence. I'm not innocent. I really did all of those things. I confess, and I throw myself at the mercy of the court. And you're basically saying, hey, I'm, I'm giving myself up and I'm, I'm asking you to, to be lenient with me. I'm, I'm hoping that there will be mercy and not, you know, the death penalty for the things that I've done. And so that's the idea I get from throwing yourself or falling upon the stone. You're throwing yourself on the mercy of Jesus, and you're going to find mercy when you do that, right? So even after all of these things that these guys have done to him, even after all of the 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 attacks that they've thrown him in, and they know, or Jesus knows he, that they're going to end their 
their stewardship by crucifying him. Um, he's still offering, offering them mercy, but it's not cheap mercy. It's the kind of mercy, it's going to break you if you accept Jesus' mercy. It's not going to be, be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. Uh, imagine the kinds of things that the Pharisees would have to give up if they were to decide right here and now, hey, you're right, Jesus, we're wrong, you're right, we're going to follow you, repent. It would be pretty difficult. They had a lot of power. They had a lot of their lives riding on them being Pharisees, them being the guys in charge. Uh, Paul the Apostle talked about that because before Paul was an apostle, he was Saul the Pharisee. And he talked about what it was like for him to repent, what he had to give up to repent and follow Jesus. This is the book of Philippians. It's going to be a weird Sunday if I don't quote the book of Philippians, right? Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 7, Paul says, If anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. So Paul talks about his life as a Pharisee. This is who I am. In the flesh, I had confidence. Everything that, that I was gave me confidence that I was righteous, I was a stand-up guy, I knew what I was doing, and everyone should listen to me. That's how he felt about himself. And for him to repent and follow Jesus, he didn't just lose a lifestyle. He didn't just lose his stuff. He, let, he had to lose everything that made up his whole self-image, who he thought about himself as a human being. He had to lay that, all of that down. That's costly. And it broke him. On the road to Damascus, he was a blind, crumpled up heap on the side of the road. God knocked him off his horse and he had to be led away by his hand. Not confident in the flesh any longer. It broke him, but God didn't leave him broken. God restored his sight. He put him back together. He picked up the broken pieces of Saul, the persecutor, and he built out of him, Paul, the apostle. And that's the offer I think that Jesus is offering to these men right here. I think we could have had, you know, a whole army of apostles like Paul if these Pharisees had decided that, that, yeah, I repent, I fall upon you, show me mercy. And God would have rebuilt them into such strong leaders, but they're refusing. And now because they're refusing, judgment is coming. If you're not going to fall on the stone, the stone is going to fall on you. And that's not a breaking into pieces that can be mended, it's a crushing. And some of the other Gospels say that if the stone falls on you, it is going to crush you to powder. You can't rebuild something that's been crushed to powder. And when Jesus died and he rose again, the stone fell and crushed the authority of the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. And it wasn't invested anywhere else. God didn't make a new priesthood for us to follow. It was broken beyond repair. And we don't need priests. We don't need scribes and Pharisees. We don't need any kind of middleman. Jeff and I, we're not middlemen between you and God to, you know, offer prayers on your behalf or to, you know, receive God's holy word so that we can impart it to you. No, all of us, God has given to all of us the authority to hear from him from his word. God has given to all of us the authority to walk into his throne room by Jesus' name and offer up all of our prayers to him. And that brings us to the here and now, right? We're not just talking about the Pharisees anymore. We're not talking about the chief priests. We're talking about us. Because the invitation and the warning that Jesus gave to those men then, he's giving to us also. You know, it, the, the problem of men and humanity, women also, getting caught up in their own authority and uh, abusing their stewardship is not over just because the scribes and Pharisees are gone. It didn't disappear with the Pharisees. In fact, in the book of Romans, Paul warns us about getting caught up in, in pride and arrogance the same way that the scribes and Pharisees did. He was talking to Gentiles, and the Gentiles were looking down on Israel. They, they thought, hey, you know what? Israel's done, God abandoned them, and now he has made us his chosen people. And I've 
I've heard people still claim that God no longer cares. They're not, Israel is no longer his chosen people, but he has taken that title and given it to the church. Now the church is inheriting all the promises that God made to Israel. That's not true. But in Paul's day, that was a, a big thing that people had to be corrected by. And so we wrote in the book of Romans uh, about what that, what that was going to look like. So Romans chapter 11 my notes in the right spot. Romans 11, starting in verse uh, 17, he says, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, olive, olive tree do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you, if you are, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. And then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. That's a, a sobering warning. It shouldn't be scary. I mean, sometimes I read that and, and that's scary. But it's, it's not scary. It's sobering though. It's like standing next to a... a drop off. It's not going to jump out and get you, but you want to be careful. Don't get too close to that, that drop off because you might slip and fall the same way that Israel did. It was Israel's pride and arrogance that caused them to fall. And it says right here, hey, if he didn't spare the natural branches, he's not going to spare you either. If you get caught up in your own pride and arrogance, you think that you're the authority, then you're going to have trouble. You're going to end up in the same hot water that Israel ran into. And so this is a pretty strong uh, argument against our own pride and arrogance. Be careful. So no more smug confidence. You know, I'm righteous and you guys all need to listen to me. No more den of thieves in God's house. The middleman is gone, right? We don't have to, to think about what does the priest say for me to do? What do I need to, to offer up in, you know, so that God will listen to me? It's all been done. All of the authority of the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests, he, God has given it to us in our own lives. Basically, what I'm telling you is that God has made you a steward of your, of your own life. He's, he owns it, right? He bought it, but he's made you the steward. We don't have somebody who, who needs to tell us what to do. We have God's word directly to us. God has made you a steward, and now you're in the vineyard. Now you are the one God has rented out as his tenant, and he still wants fruit. He still wants fruit. He's going to come and ask for it. John the Baptist said, hey, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't just claim to be a child of God, but show it. Live it out. What does that mean? Well, we have the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, godliness, self-control. Those are the fruits that God is looking for in our lives. Not, you know, how loud you sing at church, not making sure you get here every single Sunday as long as the doors are open, you're in here. That's not the fruits of repentance. The fruits of repentance is how you live among the people around you with love, with kindness, with self-control. That's the fruit that God is looking for. That's what God wants us to live like. And as stewards, he's going to come around and ask, what is your life doing? We don't have anyone else who's going to answer for us. It's you and me. So let's give God the fruit that he wants. Let's live lives like Jesus did. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have eliminated the middleman, that now we don't have to wait for a, a priest to go into the temple and offer up sacrifices for us. You offered up the sacrifice. You were the sacrifice. You made it clear for us to enter into your throne room we're covered by your blood. We have the authority of your name to come before you. We're so grateful for what you've done for us. We're so grateful that we have been restored to our relationship with you. So Lord, now that we have this stewardship, now that you have made us stewards of our own lives, Lord, we want to live lives that please you. We want to live lives that glorify you. 
We want to live lives of love and, and self-control and patience with the people around us. So Lord, we, we ask that you would help us to do that, that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to be the salt and light of the earth, that we would be examples of Jesus to everyone that we run into, that people would be drawn to know you because of the love that they see in our lives. And we need you for that. We can't do it on our own, but we know that you are good and faithful. You said that you would be with us to the end of the age. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand for one last song. There is a song, I know it well, a melody that's never failed. In valleys low, my soul will rest, my confidence in you alone. Hope has a name, his name is Jesus, my Savior's cross has set the sinner free. Hope has some verses I want to leave you with. I hadn't planned this, so they're not going to be on the projection, but this is the book of John, chapter 15. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, 
and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may, may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, guys, thank you. Um, I wanted to let you guys know I forgot to announce this at the beginning, but Thursday nights I've been going through Luke. I'm going to switch that to Wednesday nights. I know that I've done this a lot. I've got five kids, which is five different ways to conflict my schedule. So before it was Wednesday nights that was my conflict. Now it's Thursday nights that's my conflict. So this week is going to be the last midweek on Thursday, and then I'm going to switch to Wednesday nights. And I'm not going to switch it to Monday and Tuesday and all the rest on you this week. But. <laughs> so Thursday, join me for Luke. And then after that, be Wednesdays. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're picking up chairs and all the rest like normal. Have a great week.